Hey everybody, this is Bart Baggett. This is Hack and Grow Rich. And thanks for being a fan of the podcast. We so appreciate your likes and your loves and your comments. And uh, this is a show that just kind of pays homage to the great book, Think and Grow Rich, but it's today. We're hacking, we're taking shortcuts, we're hacking your body, your mind, your health, your business. And the the founder and my, my co-host is Shaheen Shayan. Shaheen, hey buddy, how are you? Hey Bart. What's up? Yeah, interesting. So a lot of interesting things happening. You know, as we're recording this, we are now kind of on the, you know, it was, it, I, I was listening to this podcast. It was very interesting as far as COVID goes. We were talking about kind of if it was a movie where we would be. And funny enough, a lot of the doctors and scientists seem to agree that we are not at the end of the movie. We are just right in the middle of the action phase. And we're starting to realize this with all these variants and states opening up and closing down again. And, you know, again, science being questioned, there's riots happening in Australia against being vaccinated and, and, and these types of things. And it's a, it's a mad world, but interestingly enough, so I live in Los Angeles for you guys who don't know in the West side, which is kind of a semi affluent area in LA Venice beach now. Um, and it's funny because Bart, I, you know, we go to parties now and parties are happening again. And, you know, when I say party, I don't mean the parties of the herbal ecstasy days. Now I am a parent. I am an adult. I am expected to be responsible, even though my child talks to me and tells me what to do much more so than I tell him what to do these days. And, you know, we go to these parties and we went to one last night and it's, you never know what to expect anymore. So we walk in. And I'm like, I'm ready to hug everybody. You know, I'm vaccinated, believe in science. I'm good. Like, I'm fine. I'm not getting anything crazy in my opinion. You know, if I would have gotten it, I would have gotten it by now. Every single day I've been at jujitsu. I've been rolling jujitsu. I've been out in public. But, you know, I'm careful. I'm not stupid. You know, I, I am, you know, I take my vitamins. I take care of my metabolic health. I feel like I'm in pretty good shape. But we went to a party at somebody's house. And, okay, so... As we walk in the door, I, I'm like, all right, maybe I won't hug. I could be a hugger if it's, you know, family, friends, whatever, but all right, I'll shake hands. So I see the lady, I, I reach out to shake hands. I'm like, we're done with COVID, right? I could shake hands. And I reach my hand out and it was like, boom, elbow. I was like, elbow? Are we there now? Are we back at elbow? Because I thought we got past elbow. I thought we were like, we're like he at least here, at least wrist. But no, <laughs> she was at elbow. And then I look at her and she's wearing the mask, but she was wearing the double mask. And I was like, all right. And uh, mind you, this was an outdoor party. And I was thinking to myself, like, dude, like this is an outdoor party. These are all people we know. Every single person at this party was vaccinated. I'm like, seriously, the elbow for that? And I'm, t I'm telling my wife, all right, nope. She's like, put on your mask. I'm like, all right, whatever. Put on my mask. I'm just sitting there. And we're waiting, we're waiting. I'm like, just watch what will happen. And people start, you know, putting down a couple drinks, 20 minutes, 30% of the people masks are off in 20, <laughs> 20 minutes. Right. And they're standing like within a foot of each other. And I'm just sitting there going, do you folks know how this works? Like in order for this to be effective, you got to wear them all the time. <laughs> like, it's not, you know, and I'm not a fan of masks. I hate masks. I understand the science of them. I believe in science. I think, you know, we should we should listen to those more intelligent than ours ourselves. We should listen to those more intelligent than ourselves. An hour into the party, nobody's wearing masks. They're like one step from each other. And then here's the other crazy part about this part. I don't know if you noticed this. But so this was a party. They had a bag of chips, you know, like a bowl of chips hanging out. So everybody walking in would reach in and grab some chips, but you got to wear a mask. So how is that okay? How does that make sense, right? How do you have a bowl of nuts on the table, lady? And, you know, like, I wouldn't eat those pre-COVID. <laughs> so it's, it's awkward, but it happens. And I think it's, it's moved much more so to kind of a symbol of, 
it, it, it is it is a little bit of virtue signaling and a symbol of like politi political correctness and where you stand on things and that that goes on both ends but on another another level i think it's kind of like the subconscious comfort thing where people are looking for cues from other people in a social environment and everybody has lost track nearly everybody has lost track of like oh you know like what what is the science of this what is the logic behind what we're doing? And, you know, I'm not an anti-masker. I'm not an anti-vaxxer. And, you know, again, I, I strongly believe in science. And, you know, if we're going to do it, we should do it. But I think, like, we should do it correctly. I don't know how you feel about this stuff, Bart. Well, I, I recall when it all started, we started elbowing instead of hugging. And, and all of a sudden, we didn't know what to do. And I, and I like you, kind of thought we were in the third act of the hero's journey. You know, it's all over. We got vaccines. Everyone's going to get it, and we can get back to normal life. And to see what's been happening has been really shocking. I, I feel very blessed because all my businesses have expanded during COVID. You know, I'm heavy, heavy on, on audio, video, our training schools. We have a lot of students in India and around the world. So for me, it actually shifted even our consulting business online. So I was one of the lucky businesses that was able to pivot and profit. Now, socially, I still feel kind of alone. Like I'm not seeing as many people and friends. You and I haven't seen each other in a while. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely business by business, which actually moves us into kind of the topic we're going to talk about Um in case you're tuned in, this is not a COVID presentation. This is a business. This is a business podcast. We're not about making money here. Um, but one of the things that we're going to talk about is how you can exit a business and get that windfall of millions of dollars. And I have always been in the business where I am the brand. So I'm, you know, wrote a book when I was 23. We've got a program uh, related to personal growth. I mean, it's really all about me, Shaheen. So it's hard for me to sell my brand. Because I have to be alive. Like I've always said, you know, Tony Robbins has got an amazing career, but he really can't sell his brand. He even tried to franchise it years ago and bought them all back. Like it's very difficult to put your face on something and then have that be able to be sold and walk away if they, if they think they're doing business with an individual. And what I want to chat about is this new trend. And we happen to have one of the top Amazon experts sitting right here across the microphone from me uh, of building an Amazon business for two or three years and then being able to walk away for millions of dollars. And and before I even get into to what your expertise is, which is so great, is for most of us, until the internet came along, it's mom and pop, a local hardware store, a hairdresser, all these local brick and mortar stuff. You know, you had to either build a chain, manage that chain, build a franchise, buy a franchise, which of course you can't resell. I mean, you could resell the franchise unit, but it really wasn't for most middle american sort of not 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 worker bees but we're talking entrepreneurs we didn't have an exit strategy and so the for, the term exit strategy is something i really want to get into because so many of us including myself didn't start a business with that in mind and i love what you've been doing for the last 10 to 15 years because any one of your brands doesn't have shaheen on them because you've shown me some of the stuff you sell and i'm like oh my god was that was that made in France? That's amazing. Whatever that thing is, yet you could literally walk away, and your customers would not know that it changed hands. And I think that's just a brilliant business model because some of us take five or ten years to build a brand, but then we can't get rid of it. I, that's why I want to do more what you're doing, which is which is building that brand. Is it a trend now for people to exit with two, three more million dollars after working for three or four years? Because that's so attractive. So there's a couple things that you, you have to consider, and you're absolutely right, Bart. So the issue with what you do is that you are not a product, even though you may be selling products, just like Tony Robbins, you are a service business. And the service is the service of you, which is where we talk about this a lot, no matter how many hours, how much you get paid, I should say, no matter how much you get paid per hour, we all have the same amount of hours. So you can't create more hours in the day. Well, you have 24 just hours. Just yeah. to parallel me, I, I learned that 20 years ago, and I said, I'm going to package information. And so now I can sell books, remember books and videotapes and VHS. Right. So, so I've duplicated myself through information, but yeah. it's still me. Like it's right. very, if I die, the brand is going to die very quickly because I'm not out promoting it. So yeah, right. I, I did as much pivot as I could to not sell my time and I still get mad at myself when I do, but I can't sell the brand. 
So keep going because you were on the, you were on a path there. I just want to say yeah. I'm not totally service. Right. No, but you're you're diversified in other ways. So you're now doing cash flow positive of real estate, which is amazing yeah. and real estate development. And you know, what we talk about is foundational thinking. So you're thinking foundationally, and those businesses will carry on. Those are the legacy businesses and the legacy revenue that you're that you're building. So for those of you guys who have never sold a business, we should talk a little bit about this, how this works. So most people think of a product, think of an idea, they launch it and they think, great, I'm going to launch it, see if I can make some money. They don't think about the exit on the other end. Some people think only about the exit. That is the rarity. That is the less than 1%. The fact is, if you're building a business to sell it, and that's your only idea, the likelihood of you succeeding is almost nil. And the reason is because, again, we talk about this, you are not chasing excellence, you're chasing money. And we talk about something that a mentor of mine, Stuart Wilde, taught us, don't lean into things. And so you're leaning into just chasing money. And you forget about the excitement and fun that goes into building the business because you're like, man, I'm going to build something and I'm going to sell it for $100 million. Okay, great. What are you going to build? I don't know, but I'm going to get $100 million. It's like the guy that, you know, Bart, the guy that's going to go out there and it's like, man, I want a job that pays me 500 grand a year. It's like, okay, what do you want to do? Anything, anything, as long as I get the money. It's like, well, dude, you're not going to get a job. And they end up taking something a lot less than that, that they hate doing because they have not specified what they want. It's an amazing thing. I, I don't know how this stuff works. Again, this falls into the category of woo-woo. But when you set your intention for the thing that you want, there's a way where things start moving in that direction. And everybody I know who's successful has had that happen to them. So I, I break it down. We, we have a program called the PRISM Life Design, P-R-I-S-M. And we say we don't really want to discuss your goals. Yeah. We want to discuss your navigation values. So as you move toward adventure, happiness, contribution, making a difference, whatever these core values are, and it can take hours to pull these out of people because people is not a conversation people know. But if you're moving toward and you're 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 bathing in this in this in this bath of something that you adore, which are kind of in your values, like the things you love, performing or comedy or whatever. Any goal you pick, as long as it's aligned, you're going to be joyous as you get there. And if you're joyous as you get there, it's a whole lot more likely you're going to be successful. So we really talk about outcomes versus goals. And so they're really – and I don't think it's woo-woo. I really don't, Shaheen. I kind of think the brain is programmable if you understand language and understand kinesthetics and emotions and you understand the language of the program that goes into the brain. But you're correct. So many people don't think about the exit. But if I were – to, so, so I've already got four or five businesses. Let's make a six one tonight. I'm going to do something on Amazon, Shaheen, because I love what you do. I want to be part of your coaching program. I'm going to pick a product that I care a little bit about, right? I mean, I sure. need to care a little bit about it. So motorcycles, MMA, like there's a lot of stuff, you know, motorcycle parts. Like I would probably get excited about that, right? Because I drive a big badass motorcycle. But yeah. would you tell me to go sell iced tea? Well, I, you know, again, we te- that I think I think we're veering off a little bit, but you know, what we teach people is don't follow your passions, don't play your hunch. It'll have your lunch. We say that often. The riches are in the niches. Find what the market's demanding and feed it that. Now, if that thing is aligned with your passions, your desires, the things that you want, great. More power to you, Bart. But it's a great place to start. So we might start looking at MMA stuff. We might start looking at motorcycle stuff using tools that we use to teach people how to discover those things on Amazon. And then we might discover something totally different. But motorcycles in general is a very broad, um, motorcycle parts or motorcycle accessories, a very broad category. So what we'd want to do is break it down into a niche and find a niche that will sh- that, that is underserved and that the competition is weak where we can come in and dominate. And we teach this all the time on Amazon Mastery. We've got a one-hour course. Anybody that's interested, reach out because you're listening to this podcast. It's a $200 course. We'll give it to you absolutely for free. And we'll share the URL in the show notes or just reach out to me anyway. You can contact me and let me know you heard it on Hack and Grow Rich. But, but let me take a metaphor and, and, and transition into our topic. So sure. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make tassels off of my motorcycles and some some tassels on my bags you know like nice. the old western remember the the cowboys had the tassels in the 1970s very yeah. very uh, very 1970s totally ugly but it becomes a trend 
And now sure. like I've got the number one motorcycle tassel store. How do I then exit that? Cause I'm tired of tassels now. It's taken three out three years. I'm exhausted. I don't want to talk to any more Harley or Indian owners. Now, is there a market to get out of that or I just shut the store down? Yeah. So let me complete the picture of what I was saying. The answer is yes, there is a way to get out of it. So the people who are seeking to start a business to sell it generally don't succeed. The people who never think about selling a business will have a rude awakening when it comes time to sell their business and what they can get for it. With that said, you want to be somewhere in the middle. You want to have an idea of how you're going to exit when you sell the company, but you build the company seeking excellence, seeking to master the values. You know, if it's an Amazon company, the values that we teach, but if not your own values and to master providing excellence to other people, telling a better story, creating a better product, being the best damn tassel manufacturer out there. And, you know, and from there we can talk about selling it. So, for anybody who doesn't know how businesses are sold, usually businesses are sold based on a formula. And that formula is based on your EBITDA, which is effectively your net profit, which is the money that you get after taxes and, and all that stuff is done. In the past, businesses have sold anywhere from on the very low end, 1.5 times your EBITDA. So that means, let's say you've got a company that's earning, bringing in, let's say a million dollars a year, uh, but your, your take home, your EBITDA is 100,000. If it's 1.5 times that, that means you could sell your company for 150,000. That's on the low end. On the high end, companies go for 20X. Right now, FinTech companies, for example, crazy metric, are going for 19 to 20 times for technology, finance, finance and technology companies going 20 times. So if you were a fintech company with $100,000 in revenue, you could be or you could sell your company for $2 million. Right? We go for 20 times that $100,000 EBITDA. 100,000 so net profit. Net profit, right? Your your EBITDA. So it's a it's a it's a metric of that. Now, something has happened in the last few years. And where this this brings us to our topic, Bart, should I jump into it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I love this. This is, this is really exciting for me. And I think a lot of our listeners, because we not only want to do business, we want to do business better and have more lifestyle, but we'd like an exit. And before you just let me tell you something, I was coaching one of my friends is, you know, most people, unless you're an entrepreneur that sells businesses, don't get windfalls of money, but once in life when they get their inheritance or they get like a divorce or they win the lottery, which is rare. So, so if most people aren't used to getting three or $4 million at once and then they blow it. You know what I mean? So this is a this is sort of a conversation where you could plan every five to ten years to get another windfall of money without anybody dying. That's how exciting this conversation is to me. So please go. Yeah, and like we talk about it when we talk about foundational thinking, it's just another piece of real estate. And when it becomes time to sell your piece of real estate, you need to be aware of what to do. Now, something really unusual has happened. Something very interesting. And this is particularly for Amazon sellers and Amazon FBA sellers. So we're going to talk about this. What I want to do now is I'm going to share a little video from CNBC with you. And I'm going to share that right now so you guys can watch this and we can have a little convo about this. It's only just about a minute long. And it'll give you an idea of what we're talking about. It's about Amazon aggregators. So Bart, can you see my screen? I'm going to stop the share there. Let's try this one more time. All right, optimize, and we're going to go here. Bart, can you see my screen? Thumbs up if you can. I can see the screen. I just want to let you know that in case we have to delete this video for whatever copyrights, we'll recap it for you after we show it. Yeah, I think we're okay. Um, so here we go. The clients at this exclusive Las Vegas party come from a different world than you might expect. They're third-party merchants who sell on Amazon, and the companies wooing them, aggregators, have rapidly become one of the hottest segments of the startup world. More than 60 Amazon aggregators have popped up in the last couple years, raising billions in big funding rounds to buy up small and medium businesses that sell on Amazon. Usually, aggregators take a brand over, buying out the entrepreneur who started it, sometimes for millions. Then they use large-scale software and marketing solutions to try to boost the brand's sales. 
Okay, so what they're talking about here is aggregators. What we're talking about is billions of dollars being pumped into these companies. Some of them started as SPACs, which are companies that people put money into, no specific investment, but for these investments to go out there and find something to invest in. And some of them started off as startups. And what they are is startup funds that are going out there to buy Amazon companies. So if you have been an Amazon seller and an Amazon FBA brand seller and had products that you were selling on the Amazon platform, you now are a hot commodity. You are the prettiest girl at the ball. In July, aggregators flocked to the sixth annual Prosper Show in Las Vegas, looking to entice new acquisitions at the popular conference for Amazon sellers. So this was a conference that they had for Amazon sellers. Let's see if we can fast forward through this because we're only going to be showing some clips of this. To anyone who refers a seller, it... Here's one company that's offering a free Tesla to anybody who sends them a company to buy. Now, of course, those companies have to have a million dollars or more in revenue, which by the way, guys, for Amazon companies is not high. And I'm going to tell you guys, I'm going to explain to you guys all about this phenomena. So buying. This is a big change from the last in-person Prosper show in 2019 when the Am And you can check out this whole video on CNBC, by the way. So please make sure to watch it on the CNBC website if you're interested more I would want the dollars to spend are losing share to these small entrepreneurs. Ag yeah, so what they're talking about now is aggregators, um, which are these companies that we're talking about, know that these big brands are losing market share because on Amazon, we tell this all the time, you can go on there, have a brand of soap, tell a better story and beat out a big brand that's owned by Procter & Gamble or beat out a brand that's owned by one of these other companies. Why? Because the storytelling mechanism on Amazon is different. And now you can pull those triggers that make people buy without having a multi-billion dollar ad budget like some of these companies do. Let's get to the end of this video. To keep the number of acquisitions small, Payday has acquired 16 brands, far fewer than... All right, so now you see a bunch of these guys. Usually they're young guys that they hire. Most of the ones that I've talked to, and I talk to them every day, have been younger in, in Bend. So they're, they're, they're tapping into the Silicon Valley uh, talent pool. A lot of these guys are former Silicon Valley CEOs. One of the notoriously difficult things about the seller business is that Amazon constantly changes its. All right. Well, we're having some problems with the video, so I'm going to stop the share, but we can talk about this. So let me tell you what's going on here. So you've got these aggregators. Wall Street has pumped. Bart, are you ready for this? Over 20. Billion with billion. a B, 20 billion. Wow. And it might be more, much more than that, dollars into these aggregators. Certain aggregators like Thrasio have raised nearly a, a billion dollars, and rumor has it that they're going to go public. And I'm going to open the, you know, the curtain on how this is working so you guys can can try to understand how this works. So you're the first guy who's doing this. Okay, so I think like Thrasio was one of the first aggregators. They went out to Wall Street and to investors allegedly and said, hey, uh, you know, we want some money. We're gonna pick up these Amazon brands. And our exit plan is that we'll eventually go public or roll them up or sell them to a bigger firm, right? There are really only so many moves you can make. So they went out there and they started picking up companies. Now, I'm just using them as an example. I don't know specifically what they did outside of what I've read or heard. But let's assume, you know, there's a bunch of these guys. So what, what, what these aggregators in general did was they went out there and they said, hey, you know, we're going to now roll up these companies. And these Amazon companies were pretty excited. And they went to them and they said, hey, you know, we're paying a multiple. Remember, now you're getting a multiple of your EBITDA with some multiple of your net profit roughly. And they said, okay, we're going to pay two or three times multiple. And then we'll give you what's called an earnout. Okay. An earnout means that they will pay you an additional amount of money or any amount of money 
based on the representations that you're making. You're saying, hey, man, I've got the best motorcycle tassel company in the world. Um, and we're, you know, we made 5 million this year, but next year we're definitely going to make 10 million because we've got Harley Davidson himself, uh, on our, on our influencer list. Yeah. All right, great. So based on that representation, we're not going to give you a two time multiple. We'll give you a four time multiple, but we're going to give you two time in cash and two time as an earnout. As long as you hit those goals, you hit those metrics, you make 10 million, you're going to get four time multiple. But if you only get $2 million, then we're not going to pay you that. That's how, that's how earnouts work. Well, the first guy that came along said, hey, they didn't even have to pay an earnout. They're like, we'll pay you two and a half. That's fair market. Because it's an Amazon company, the risk is higher. Because there's only one place where you're selling your products. If the risk is diversified, you're selling in brick and mortar, you're selling on eBay, Etsy, Walmart, you're, you've got your own distribution, people are buying directly from you on your own website, excuse me, if those things are happening, then the risk is more diversified and the value of your company is generally higher. But now these aggregators are looking for Amazon only brands. They really don't care about any of that other stuff. They really want you to be Amazon only. So what they did was the first guy who came along got the company for 2.5. Then a few other guys went to 2.5. And then finally one guy said, you know what? There seems to be a lot of you guys. I'm not going to sell for 2.5. I want 3.5. And they all, you know, went, oh my God, oh my God. They said, all right, we'll give you 3.5. Then the next guy said, you know what? I want 4.5. I want 5.5. And that number went up and up and up. The problem that these aggregators are facing right now is that while there are millions of Amazon sellers, the amount of Amazon sellers whose sales are in the millions that make it worthwhile for them to be a million and up. A lot of these aggregators are only buying companies that have EBITDA of a million and up, maybe 500,000 and up now because the numbers are, are going down and down and down as these companies are being bought are greatly reduced. So you have this money being pumped in from Wall Street, billions of dollars that needs to be deployed. One thing I learned from my many companies that I've had and from raising several rounds of investment in, in various companies that I've had is that investors don't like money sitting around. Once they invest in you, they want that money to go to work like little soldiers marching off to war. They want to deploy. And if these aggregators are not deploying these soldiers, something's wrong. But the problem is these Amazon companies are either holding out, not selling, or they've already sold. So now these companies have these grand business plans. They've got billions of dollars in the bank, and there aren't enough companies to buy. So what happens? The price what do you think up. happens? Price goes up, supply and demand. Now the they few want- that are there, just like our real estate market recently. The price goes up. Now they're demanding more and there's fewer ones. Absolutely. So so now are they going to be profitable? I guess that's the big question. I think the video said there's only two unicorns now, which is still two more than we had five years ago, that are just aggregators of Amazon companies. Quite impressive to be a billion dollar company. So I'll give you an example. And, and, and let me tell you what the play is for these companies. Here's the play. We have a company now that we're looking to sell. Things have gotten crazy. We've gotten into double digit multiples. That means it's no longer two time, three time multiple. We're talking 10 time, 15 time, 20 time multiples, getting up there with the fintech because they need to deploy these funds a lot quicker than we need to sell. We're happy to hang on to our companies because our companies are cash flowing, they're generating revenue. We know what we're doing. We are experts on Amazon. In fact, we teach and train people how to create these companies and sell on Amazon. So we are cool there. These companies, their whole pitch is, hey, man, we've hired former Amazon employees. We've done such a great job at Amazon. We're really like experts and we've got a crack team at Amazon. So while you are great at selling your whatever product or company that you're, you're selling right now, Imagine if you brought it into our infrastructure. We know how to get reviews. We know how to get ranking. We can put millions of dollars into advertising, which they will not do. 
but we know how to put all this money into advertising to help pump your product out and we'll get you uh, a much higher ranking and much higher sales. So you should sell to us and take an earn out. That's the pitch because then they'll have more funds to deploy and, and hypothetically be able to buy more companies. But what's really happening is that sellers, and I, I've got my ear to the, you know, ear to the ground in all different seller communities, sellers are not selling. They're holding out. It's like a real estate bubble and it probably is a bubble. I, we don't know how much longer this particular thing will last, but if these companies, these SPACs and aggregators want to stay around, A, you got to remember they've got to be competitive with strategic buyers. A strategic buyer is somebody who wants to buy your company, your brand, your product, because they feel that it will have a strategic value or advantage to them. They are not aggregators. If you have a soap product and Procter & Gamble calls you, that is a strategic buyer. Strategic buyers traditionally pay more because they're not just looking at EBITDA, they're looking at other factors. So in our case, we've got a couple major tea companies interested in buying one of our tea brands. And these are strategic buyers. So we've got the aggregators interested who are negotiating and doing due diligence and offering all types of multiples. But then we also have strategic buyers interested. So it's creating a little bit of a bidding war. Now, if these aggregators were sitting around with these billions of dollars in their bank account, just don't have enough companies to buy at whatever rates they were paying six months ago, two months ago, one month ago, last week, what's going to happen? Someone's going to step in and be like, you know what? I know you were asking for a nine time multiple. I'll pay you 10 and I'm going to take it from out under these guys. Why? Because even if they were to buy you for a double digit multiple, let's say 10 times, let's say 20 times, if they were to take that entity public, they immediately, Bart, overnight would realize a 30 time to 40 time multiple of increase in value just based on stock value alone, which is why it makes sense to them to buy these companies for 10 times, 20 times, 30 times even would make sense in some cases. So these multiples, while insane in a normal world, in a bubble may make sense for them. And so now that's what we're seeing. We're seeing aggregators going toe to toe with strategic buyers. We're seeing aggregators go toe to toe with international buyers, which is the other thing that's happening. There's a Chinese aggregator now that has apparently raised billions of dollars, maybe partially allegedly funded by, um, you know, uh, we'll, we'll just say official sources. And there's Russian aggregators now looking to buy out these Amazon companies. I've been talking to Korean companies, Japanese companies. This is the hot market. So if you are not selling on Amazon right now, guys, there's no better time. We don't know how long this bubble will last. It's definitely not going to last forever. And I actually see it tapering down in the next two years or sooner. So if you want to get out there and create this value, come join us on Amazon Mastery. Reach out to us. I'll share the one-hour course. It's absolutely free. But let's get back to the to the matter at hand. Can I, so, can I ask a clarifying question? Yeah. And I, I, I hope it doesn't make me feel ignorant. I made a comment a couple of shows ago that said, you know, I'm not sure, Shaheen, I'll ever be a billionaire unless I own a public company or, or a company goes public, which is how most people become billionaires unless you inherit it. And and just to clarify, for me as well as a lot of listeners that may have never had the, the gone public or sell company, if I give you a million dollars to invest in one of your brands, okay, and I own 50% of this brand. At the end of the year, we're gonna share the profits, right? But if you roll that up and make it a public company, my million dollar investment might be worth 30 million? Like, explain the math, like why does going public all of a sudden take something with a million dollar profit and now all the stockholders are 30 million? Like, run me through sort of the process again because I, I've never taken a company public, and I think it's very interesting how the numbers simply don't add up. And so the real, the retail investors, which is what stock is, right, they're just getting a small portion of ownership, not necessarily equity. Okay, let me preface this by saying, although I do trade and hold positions in different companies from different times, I am not an expert in trading. Stock markets are going public, 
And in no way am I offering financial advice to anybody. You should look at me at just slightly higher than a chimpanzee when it comes to financial advice or health. So please don't base any of your decisions on anything that I say. But what I will say is, look, I, I traded commodities for years, highly leveraged hundreds of millions of dollars in commodities like gold and you know oil, pork bellies, whatever. And the one thing that I learned, Bart, from all of this, and I think this is going to answer your question, is that the markets are not based on much more than one thing. And that element is human emotion. The markets are moved by emotion, and they are not reasonable or logical. If they were reasonable or logical, we would all figure it out. and We would be like Jim Simmons, who runs Renaissance Funds, who's one of the most intelligent guys I've, I've ever heard of, who's got a fund that allegedly you know, has, has never failed and made money year after year, and you know, he's one of the masters of quant trading. If you're not one of those guys, and there's, there's maybe a handful of those guys on the planet, looking at the markets, you've, you've got to think of them as being moved by emotion. So the reason why, Bart, having companies like that could have 30x in value, 40x or 50x in value to the company's stock price is because of the emotion attached to those brands and the perceived value and the perceived increase in the value of that company once it acquires that thing. It also happens with talent. You know, if you have a, a big company and they grab a famous CEO, that could send the stock price up many multiples. So these are things that from my experience, and, and guys, if you feel differently, please make sure to comment below on the comments or send us your comments. We'd love to hear your, your comments and questions. But um, I really feel like this is the kind of thing that is, is, is really truly, you know, moved by human emotion. So that, that really answers the question about stock. So if I'm building, and I, and I actually uh, took a, a really fascinating weekend seminar, my friend Mike Warren, who teach people how to buy businesses, and I actually started to acquire or have conversations to acquire the business. And immediately what I noticed with a lot of small businesses is they're saying they're making 300000 a year, but they're not taking out their own salary. And so, so you're really not because they're taking $150,000 out. So trying to find the real uh, you know, earnings before taxes is a challenge with small businesses. And the other thing I noticed about that, I think it was, um, I think it was a, a brand that sold gun holsters or something very specific, is, is all of his, like 60% of his revenue is from one client. And I thought if this client is based on this guy's relationship and we lose one client, the whole company is now worth 60% less. So I bailed out of that business. So that's that way. But that, but that's one way to do it is getting one to five x my net profit. The second way is to go public. How, is there any way we can dip our toes in that pond of going public with a company like an Amazon company? Yeah. So these aggregators and guys, thank you for anybody who's joining us now on Facebook Live. We're going to be streaming portions of our show on Facebook Live. So if you guys are just joining us on Facebook Live, make sure to type in your questions for Bart or myself below. We'll try to get to all of your questions as we go. Make sure to like or comment as we move along with this. So the answer, Bart, is, is, is really that yes, there, there is a way to benefit. And that's really what they pitch you as the earn out. I always tell people, look, if you can take cash off the table, as much cash as you can get. My recommendation for Amazon sellers is if you get aggregators or if you get into a position where you can create a bidding war, a bidding frenzy, like happens with a lot of our companies and brands that we sell. If you can get into that position, welcome an earn out, but welcome the earn out above and beyond the highest offer. So the earnout just becomes icing on the cake. And for you guys that are just joining us, we're talking about selling Amazon businesses and we're talking about these aggregators that are now coming in, aggregators like Thrasio and Perch and Cellarax that are coming in and scooping up these Amazon companies left and right and rolling them up. And so if you do get into this earnout, 
you may be able to ask for some percentage of the earnings of the company should the company go public, should the company merge with another public company, should the company be acquired. And those are ways where you could practice upside. Me, myself, I've never been a fan of that, particularly for Amazon companies, because I really have it. I have a hard time believing that anybody could do better for my business than me. And considering that, you know, I, I understand Amazon and I've got experts on my team that understand how to stay within Amazon's terms of service, how to rank products. And, you know, we teach that to people all day long. It's, it's challenging for me to believe that a big company that's acquired multiple, multiple brands is going to give extra love to my company just because. It's probably not going to happen. They probably are going to plug it into a system and plug it into an ecosphere, which is what I would do. I would just plug it into a system and let it run its course and enjoy the added increased value that that company might bring. Well, in, in all fairness, you're a very sophisticated seller with multiple brands. I would say the majority of what we'd call mom and pop businesses that are now online, you know, five, six, seven employees, you know, they, they don't have hundreds of resources like you do. So in those cases, maybe they could. And I think the article we read, yes, they may have a little more experience in creative or SEO or branding than we do. And then, yes, you're probably better at customer service, but they run the, the you know, 500 checklist of things to cover within a company. So in many cases, mom and pop, you can do it better. You know, my, my dad's an entrepreneur, and I always saw him struggle with once he had four or five employees, he, he just didn't do, he really never grew, grew past that. Like, he wanted mass control versus delegation and systems and being able to really scale a company, which is what it takes to go from one to 10 million and then 10 million to 100. And a lot of these companies, they're looking at the minimum of a million dollars in revenue, you know, minimum, because otherwise it's not worth all the paperwork to try and do it. So you're right. A lot of companies don't make a million dollars a year. And I know if you don't own a company, that sounds like a heck of a lot of money. But you could burn through that pretty quickly every month. <laughs> it's not as much as you think. Yeah. So what we might see is that metric changing. Look, these companies are eager and excited to pick up Amazon companies. And if the market dries up and there aren't that many companies, they may start looking at potentials. Uh, they might start looking at uh, potential uh, targets for them to acquire. They might start looking at uh, using a different metric uh, to acquire those potential targets, and that might be total earnings. Look, if a company is earning $40 million and maybe they're only making $500,000 in profit and their metric is a million dollars, they might look at that and go, hey, there might be some efficiencies to be had here. We might be able to reduce costs using our infrastructure and to be able to turn that 500,000 into, you know, a uh, couple million dollars instead of just 500,000. So why don't we look at a different metric for doing that? I think what's exciting about this conversation of aggregators is before this became a thing where the stock market was pushing money saying, go buy companies and roll them up, you had to go find a suitor. You had to go find a similar company, a bigger company in your niche and say, hey, look, I got a soap. You're our biggest soap seller. Let's let's buy my company. Like you had to go find these suitors directly or they found you rather than now. Literally, you can walk the halls of a Las Vegas convention and they're waiting for you. I mean, that's I think that's the big switch in the last couple of years is they're looking for you before you had to be at lucky or you had to go find them. Yeah, and a lot of these companies now are retaining the service, or I shouldn't say a lot, but several of them are retaining the, retaining the service of business brokers. So there's brokers that will act as a middleman between you and potential buyers, and they'll gather them all together. They'll create what's called a book, which is really just a, a offering memorandum for your company, and they'll handle all the you know legalities of it. You still need an attorney but these brokers will handle it. What's even more interesting is I think for the first time in the history of a lot of these Amazon aggregators, one or two of our companies have been approached by investment bankers. Now, investment bankers might do the same thing as these brokers do, but on a larger level, which is an indicator of where the market is. If, if you've got big name investment bankers coming in to represent Amazon sellers, you now know that this is a big commodity and that these Amazon companies now are worth their weight in gold, literally. 
and if you've got strategics that are looking to get into those games too, look, if I was a strategic, if I was Procter and Gamble or Johnson and Johnson, I'd be like, Hey, why do I want to wait for these aggregators to pick up these companies for me to just come in and either a have another big behemoth come and compete with me. That's got more brands and more success than us. Why don't we go in and instead of offering them 10, I know the aggregators are offering a 10 time earning multiple. Why don't we just offer 15 and take any significant brands off the table now? What if that were to happen? Wouldn't that be interesting? Where would that take the market? It's, it, you know, Bart, it's very similar uh, for me to the real estate market right now in California which I know you're familiar with. I know you're well, in even uh, one of the things that happened in the last year is is big companies were buying up portfolios of single family homes which is something that used to be the domain of the mom and pop flipper. You know, there's all those TV shows, Flip My House and stuff. It used to be mom and pop or small businesses. And so all of a sudden there's these big companies with big pocketbooks buying up 400 houses in a neighborhood, which in essence is going to increase the cost for the, every, all the other investors. You know, that's the fear in the industry or so the real estate industry. You're saying the same thing might be happening in the business world, especially in the ecosystem of Amazon, is now that you've got so much big money coming in, all the prices go up. All the prices go up. And, and guys, you heard it here first on Hack and Grow Rich, and I'm letting you guys know that this is going to be the business that you want to get into for the next couple of years. Learn about selling on the Amazon platform. Think about creating a product like Bart is saying, Bart's going to be joining up. I've known Bart for years and I know he's got some really great ideas and a great business sense about him. So I think this is going to be a great move for Bart, but I think you guys should all do it right now. Amazon is open. You can be a third party seller with little or no money. I wouldn't say no money, but I like the way that sounds, but little money on the Amazon platform, get invested. If you don't have the money, get yourself an investor, figure out how you can get some money together to start an Amazon company because Look, I, I talk to people about this all the time. We've got a friend who's got one of the best Thai restaurants in LA, our friend John. And uh, his restaurant really is the bomb. I mean, really outstanding food, probably the best outside of Bangkok. And it's called uh, Thai Emporium in Westwood. And we talk to him all the time and we're like, hey, John, what's it cost to start a restaurant in LA? He's like, you know, a million bucks. I'm like, a million bucks? What do you get? Like, do you get Spago? Do you get like uh, you know, some fancy restaurant. Like, oh no, no. I mean, he's talking about just a normal restaurant with tables. A million dollars is not unusual to start that business. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. A million bucks. And then when can you start realizing a profit? Ooh, well, if you spend that much, could be four to five years. Really? And so we researched some of the statistics about that. And 90 something percent of these restaurants go out of business in the first year. So you have less than 10% chance of success. Now, if you were one of the few lucky ones to succeed and all the cards are stacked against you, you have now spent a million dollars to have a business in four or five years that potentially could be worth two, three, maybe three and a half times your earnings. Now, in contrast, let's take a look at Amazon. What would it cost you to start an Amazon business? 25,000 bucks? Not even. I know people who've started an Amazon business for two to 5,000, but let's say $10,000. You could very comfortably start an Amazon business for $10,000 today, tonight. When you get home on your computer, or if you're on your computer now, start an Amazon seller account. Super easy. It takes a little while. It's not super easy anymore, but it takes a little while to get approved by Amazon. They just, you know, make sure your ID is correct and, you know, that you've got a phone number that they verify and they do the usual checks. But you could start an Amazon company tonight. And Bart, I recommend you do that uh, as soon as you have a chance, preferably tonight. Let's say you run about 10,000 bucks through that company. You start introducing some products. Some are winners, some are, some are losers. But in general, you've got the stick to to make it work. You hire some virtual assistants, VAs like we teach through Amazon Mastery in Nicaragua and South and Central America, mastery level people that you can hire for seven, eight to $10 an hour in some cases full time to work for you. So you're not selling your hours for money. And in two years time, you get that company up to, let's say, half a million bucks in revenue, which is very feasible. 
Now, let's say you're going to be getting a five-time, 10-time multiple for selling that company if that's something that you create a valuable company that people can't do without. Well, you now have, let's, let's just say five times. You now have a company that you can sell for 22.5 million, sorry, $2.5 million plus po probably an earn out as well. And you spent $10,000. Risk, reward. Starting a brick and mortar business, a coffee shop, a restaurant, a laundry, any of these things, the risk is so much higher than starting an Amazon business. The amount of Sweat equity. Do you know my, my buddy who owns the restaurant who we were talking about works his fingers to the bone. He is there day and night. Your chef doesn't show up. Guess what you're, which hat you're wearing. Your delivery guy isn't there. Guess what, guess what you're doing in your private car. You, you don't have, you don't have a waiter. Your waiter's got, uh, you know, uh, isn't, isn't feeling well, broke his leg, whatever. Guess what you're doing. So that is the case with an Amazon business. That is not the case. Your VA doesn't work out, you hire another VA. VA stands for virtual assistant. Your accountant doesn't work out, there's a million accountants out there who know how to do Amazon perfectly. Your advertising company doesn't work out, you hire another one. There's so many with Amazon. So it is the perfect opportunity. And what we are going to see in the next couple of years, as these multiples go up and up and up, eventually leading to a little bit of a softening of this bubble. So for anybody who is interested now is the time to get in. And I urge and encourage you guys, if you don't learn it from us, learn it from somebody, but learn how to sell products on the Amazon platform. Start an Amazon seller account. We've got a course that we will give you. It's a $200 course, absolutely free. And that is on fbasellercourse.com or you can go to shaheenshayan.com. I'm going to spell it out. S-H-A-A-H-I-N c-h-e-y-e-n-e.com and we will do that guys make sure to subscribe and like our podcast is called hack and grow rich i'm here with my co-host bart baggett who is going to be telling us how we can find him if you want to learn about him his prism life design if you want to get one of his books and learn for learn more from this very wise friend that i have bart how do we get a hold of you yeah, I think probably one of the greatest things is just download a couple of my books for free. We, we created a domain called Get Bart's Book, getbartsbook.com. And again, we'd love you to buy them from Amazon. We'd love you to buy them from Audible. But but if you just want to download it for free and listen to the audiobook, it's there, and, and that gets you on our newsletter list. Um, if you're interested in sort of reworking your brain, we have something new called Life Design, and it's a, it's a brand called Prism, like the triangle P-R-I-S-M. I said it fast, and people think I'm doing ministry in prisons, and I said, no, I'm not going to prison. I've never been to prison. <laughs> it's Prism, <laughs> so the branding's a little off on that. But go to prismlifedesign.com. We've got one happening right now, which is really great if you need a little bit of extra help reworking your belief systems. Uh, Shaheen, before we go, uh, just one quick story. Um, the uh, I've, I've been on mailing list of brokers. You'd mentioned business brokers, and I've always been so fascinated how many businesses are for sale in the U.S. and how many are old school brick and mortar, and they're just giving up. And, and yeah. you look at the the line items, the EBITDA. So I was looking through these, and so there's a lot of brokers around the country. You get on their email list, and I'm just like, which one of these can we take on Amazon? Because most of these are crap businesses that I wouldn't want to own. I'm sorry that they built them for 20 years, and they're going to go down the tubes. But it's good because I was able to look at the earnings, look at the language, start understanding how people buy and sell businesses, and that's not an area that I was really familiar with more than three years ago. So that's something very interesting, yeah. which helps you understand you're building an asset, whether it's a house or whether it's a product, and you make it sell that asset and walk away. That, to me, is really exciting about the Amazon platform. Totally. Yeah. And that's a strategy for someone. I mean, I know people who are buying out companies, brick and mortar companies that are going out of business. I know one that was a big novelty business some years ago in the 80s. I'm not going to mention them by name, but they went out and they were for sale. They closed their brick and mortar. That would have been great just for their distribution. 
as well as for their relationships with vendors because they could get products for cheaper than everybody else. We've got a question from our friend Gregory Markell, and he's saying, according to data from U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, about 20% of U.S. small businesses fail within the first year. Okay, so businesses in general are 20%. I believe that. By the end of their fifth year, roughly 50% have faltered. After 10 years, only around a third of businesses have survived. Do you have any similar stats for Amazon store startups? Interesting. So obviously, Amazon stores have only been around since, I'm going to guess, around 2009, 2010, when what, what happened was Jeff Bezos opened up the platform to third-party sellers. Before that time, you could sell books on Amazon. Before then, you couldn't sell books or CDs or DVDs. It was just Amazon. And then they opened it up where third-party sellers and individuals could sell their books, CDs, and DVDs, and Amazon would take a, a piece of that. And what Bezos did is, allegedly, he went out and hired some of the smartest execs at Walmart that understood fulfillment. And what they did is they created a bulletproof fulfillment structure, which is what you see now when the Amazon guy shows up at your door and you're like, uh, how did this happen? It was, I ordered this two hours ago and it's over here at my house now. How does that work? Well, it's the genius of, of Jeff Bezos. So as far as stats go, because we don't have the amount of time as far as statistics go really you know those sales have been around for 10 years i can tell you that in general people who have amazon businesses might wind them down they more likely are going to sell them but i very rarely have seen businesses on amazon just straight up fail a because it's too easy to just pivot them into something else oh you're selling dog toys and they're not selling move into motorcycle tassels you can easily do that and figure it out so unless somebody has you know personal problems or financial problems or they have some big bombs that prohibit them from you know really getting into it generally speaking i don't know very many failure stories greg but um yeah, go ahead, Bart. They could fail because they get pulled off the platform for violating service. There's right. a lot of there's a lot of great stories of ten, twenty thousand dollars a day, and they just get canceled, just like what happened fifteen years ago with the search engines. I knew people getting checks for five and ten thousand dollars from AdSense, and all of a sudden they changed the algorithms, panda slap in SEO terms, and those checks stopped. So, so I mean, one small change or one small violation could end the business. That's probably how most of them lose because it doesn't cost anything to stay there. You just may not be number one and your sales will decrease. Yeah. And we talk about this guys in another video that Bart and I did called Amazon suspension. So make sure to check that out on the hack and grow rich channel on Amazon suspensions. But yeah, as Bart is saying, the fact is that on Amazon, they want you to know very carefully, very keenly that you are playing in the big boy sandbox. That sandbox is not yours. It is theirs. And they will not hesitate to slap you. You like my sound effect? To slap you with a suspension. If you violate their terms of service, or even if you don't, maybe you have a competitor that doesn't like you. Maybe somebody wants to take up your market share. This happens all the time on Amazon. And they will slap you with a fake copyright infringement. I've got a client right now who is selling products on Amazon and a competitor who has been ignoring the Amazon space for years just came on and smacked her with a copyright infringement claim. And when she looked, she said, they're giving a copyright that has nothing to do with the product that I'm selling. So there she's selling product B, they sent a copyright notice on product A to Amazon, just completely fraudulent because they know that what it will do is take her product down for two to three weeks while she fights it. In that time, the competing company can come in and take over her market share, strictly black hat tactic. So companies do that. And again, it comes back, Bart, to my favorite quote, while you are sleeping, your enemies are planning your demise. If you guys like that quote or you want to learn more, check out my podcast, Billion, How I Became King of the Throw Pill Cult. My book, Billion, How I Became King of the Throw Pill Cult, will be out this coming week. So make sure to check for that. We appreciate you guys. Let us know you are alive and that you enjoy the shows or hate the shows. If you hate us, if you hate me or Bart, you probably hate me more than Bart. He's He's got a kind face. <laughs> make sure to note that in the comments. Dislike us. Let us know how you feel. We love to hear from you either way. 
And if there's guests who you'd like us to have on, anybody in particular who you'd like to see me and Bart talk to, go ahead and mention it in the comments below and we'll try our best to get them on. Bart, thank you so much for being on and, and we'll, uh, we'll see everybody on the next one. Always a blast. Take care. Have a good night, everybody.